And I am excited to welcome Dr. Thomas Powers to the stage. Um, he is involved with the Hearing Industries Association, and uh, he is going to help us better understand all the things that we need to know about hearing aids and hearing loss. And um, uh, hey, Dr. Powers. How are you? Hello. Great to see you. Um, so the reason our paths crossed is there was this new regulation, I think a few months ago on, um, uh, hearing aids being offered over the counter. And, uh, I was like, man, this would make a great discussion topic to, um, uh, learn a little bit more about th that regulation, about those hearing aids but then the broader picture of hearing aids. Uh, but before we dive in to that topic, uh, Dr. Powers, tell us a little bit about your background and what, you know, uh, what got you involved in this as a profession? Yeah, well, uh, again, thanks for having me. It's great. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I've been an audiologist for uh, over 40 years. I, uh, my interest really sort of started early in my undergraduate. Uh, I was sort of a bio you know, major, one of those people that sort of thought, well, I'm gonna be in the sciences somewhere. Um, and uh, you, know, you, you sort of breeze through the book, you know, sort of the catalog of courses. And, uh, you know, speech and hearing sort of caught my eye. And, uh, you know, I was taking, you know, biology courses, organic chemistry classes and all these classes. And, and I thought, you know, this is kind of interesting. And I uh, had a, a, a person that, that was in my fraternity who was in it and he loved it. So I changed my major and uh, I ended up going on and get my master's and get my PhD in audiology at Ohio University out in, in, in Ohio. Um, was in a, a private practice after that. I, you know, like everybody, I thought I was going to teach at a university, but I had a colleague that I met and he said, come join me in my practice. And uh, so I was in uh, West Virginia fitting hearing aids, seeing patients. And, um, uh, you know, it, it, it just evolved. And I thought, well, this is fun, but maybe I'll go back to teaching. And, and then another right turn happened where I met someone who was the CEO of Siemens, the big uh, German company, which had a hearing aid division and said, uh, We'd like you to come and, and uh, you know, work with us. To, you know, I, at the time I thought, what would an audiologist do at a hearing aid company? But, but uh, <laughs> now there's a whole bunch of us working across the industry. So um, it's, it's been great. And I, I spent uh, over 35 years working at, uh, you know, at Siemens, Semantos. They've had a couple of name changes in, in there, but, uh, you know, I just did, enjoy the whole uh, hearing health space and, and broader healthcare. So, um, you know, a lot of different jobs there and uh, worked with the VA for, for quite, a, quite a bit in terms of that contract. So, uh, yeah, hearing has been a, uh, you know, big part of, of my career. My dad, of course, when he was so with us, I, you know, took, took me a long time to convince him to wear devices, even though his, uh, his son was an audiologist. So, yeah, so, yeah. well, and, and I know we're going to talk about that. And I'm glad you brought that up because it's it, I find it fascinating that the stigma associated with having a hearing aid, even though now you can't even see them, the uh, how lives are just in turmoil many times for years um, because because of that and and the del the delay in getting a hearing aid, and then usually like everything in our space. Oh, I'm not ready for that. I'm not going to get that. And then you get it. And it's like, oh, I can't believe I can't believe this. But um, okay. Um, well, let's see. Um the questions are already coming through fast and furious here, which is awesome because I want everybody in the audience to know the best thing about these discussions are that they're live and interactive. So you can ask questions, you can make comments, you can share resources. If if, if you've got a solution. But let folks know. Now, I I did say that um, what what cro made our paths cross is this over the counter uh, regulation. And uh, one of our first questions from Deborah says, "I've read that over the counter aids are not a good choice for those with tinnitus and vertigo." Um, let's. I, I think in order to understand what's uh, what over-the-counter hearing aids are good for, 
I guess we need to have a broader discussion on, you know, how, what are the different types of hearing aids and how do you know which one is right for you? Yeah, which is a, a really uh, uh, difficult and a complex uh, sometimes pathway, but um, let's start back where we we're, were headed in the beginning with this over-the-counter stuff. And so, so if I back up a little bit, hearing aids uh, were, were unregulated to some degree until 1977. And those were when the first FDA regulations came in and, and put some structure behind it. People had to see a physician prior to getting hearing aids um, and so forth from 77 until this past year. Um, the only way to get hearing aids uh, were, were to go see a professional, whether that was an audiologist like myself or a hearing aid specialist or, you know, we, we, different terms for them, hearing care professionals. Um, and now we have this whole new group of devices, well, two new, new devices. So we have what are referred to as over-the-counter and also self-fit over-the-counter. And then we have prescription. Those are the three new labels that the FDA gave to all these devices. And so um, over-the-counter are, I would say, I don't want to say they're the simplest, they're, they're a classification of devices that basically are out of the box. So you, you take it out of the box and you put, you know, if it's rechargeable, it has a battery, whatever, and um, you can put it on and maybe it has a couple of presets, maybe for listening in quiet, listening to TV, listening in noisy places, maybe uh, whatever. The self-fit devices are those that have a little more um, adjustments for you. So you might have an app and, and you've got to play around a little bit and and maybe it has some sliders like your stereo, bass and treble, and it has some uh, th ways to adjust things. And then prescriptive devices are only sold through professionals. So either an audiologist or a hearing care specialist would sell you that device. So those are the three types of devices. The over-the-counters, OTC, and I'm gonna lump them together for, for a minute here, um, are for people with perceived, and that's the key phrase, perceived mild to moderate hearing loss meaning you don't have to go get a test and you don't have to see a professional there. It's, it's specifically, I don't want to say excluded, but the, the regulation was so that you don't have to go see someone to um, maybe have it be a little bit simpler and also to reduce potentially the cost. So these, um, uh, you know, these OTC devices, then you can go purchase and, and they're intended for people with just mild to moderate hearing loss. Okay. Okay. And so, um, we have another group, which is not hearing aids. And these are called PSAPs, which are personal sound amplification products. And these- oh, Yeah, like the, the TV ears and the yeah, pocket correct. talker. Yeah. Those are pretty impressive devices and um, serve a very valuable function. Correct. And, you know, some of those are intended, uh, and that's the key phrase with the FDA, since I, I also worked with the FDA quite a bit. You have to use their phrases. It's the intended use of the device, especially a medical device. So those those are intended, you know, potentially for people with hearing loss. These these other PSAPs or personal sound amplifiers are, are amplifiers which are intended for people with relatively normal hearing, but used for things like bird watching or if you go hunting or if you're, um, you know, playing bridge in, in a noisy room and you need a little help but they're not intended for people with hearing loss. Getting back to the question that sort of drove this about tinnitus, mm -hmm. devices that are intended for to be fit on tinnitus are considered uh, what's called class two devices. Class one would be these OTC, class two would be a tinnitus device, which, which needs in general professionals to do that device. And then class three devices are cochlear implants, which is another whole, uh, another whole area of devices for those that have really severe to profound hearing loss. So the answer to the question that, that sort of pushed this was, in general, they're not intended, the OTCs are not intended uh, for people with tinnitus and or vertigo. Vertigo is uh, related to the syndrome called Meniere's when you're dizzy and, and have uh, some issues going on. Um, to treat those, really, I would suggest and recommend strongly that uh, people see a hearing professional. And in, in the case, especially of vertigo, you should probably see a, a professional, an ear, nose, and throat physician, ENT, because there could be a medical reason behind it. Um, and, and interestingly enough, some people have vertigo um, caused by an excessive amount of whack that put wax that pushes in your ear canal. 
and uh, it can actually push up against your eardrum, which then pushes the little bones in, in the back of your eardrum up against your cochlea, which is this mechanism in our head that, that allows us to hear. Um, and so it, it may not be that you have some life-threatening uh, disease or something. Um, you may just have a lot of wax in your ear. So, so you know, a lot of these things, uh, we need to make sure that we, we take care of the simple things first, I guess. And that is, uh, you know, have somebody look in your ears and then maybe have a hearing test. But if you don't want to go that route and, and you know you don't have that, then these OTCs are going to be available uh, you know, Best Buy already has started in a, in a number of their stores. We see some of the pharmacy chains that are going to uh, have these available, um, you know, a big box places, Walmart. So, I guess, I guess, as you described it, this has been re really good. I, uh, to, to, it's, it's almost like the, the products that you see over the counter are sort of like readers, you know, how people buy reading glasses and it helps them, I, you know, you don't go to the doctor, but yeah, you can read what's on the menu. But my question would be, is there any potential damage that somebody could cause by using one of these over-the-counter devices? Um, because I don't believe you can damage your eyes by using readers, but, but I'd be more concerned about my ears. Yes. Yeah, you, you can. There's a there's a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, because a lot of these aren't aren't fit by a professional, you, you don't really know how much uh, amplification or gain we call it, but how much amplification do you need? Um, and and so if you get one that has way too much for your hearing loss, what you risk is the danger of creating more hearing loss. Much like if you go to a lot of concerts and stand right next to the speaker up front, or you go to work in an environment that has a lot of loud noise and you don't have ear protection on, or shooting, et cetera, uh, we refer to that as noise-induced hearing loss. So in other words, you know, you go to a concert, you leave, and your ears are ringing a little bit, and you think, gee, I, you know, maybe that was a little too loud, but tomorrow you wake up and you seem okay. Well, the problem with that is the next time you do it, and the next time you do it, it all becomes cumulative. And all of a sudden, guess what? Now you've got a, a hearing loss that doesn't recover. And so, um, so the risk is, is that. The other risk, of course, is, uh, is you have to make sure when you assemble the device that some of these over-the-counter might have a little tip on the end that, you know, uh, different sizes for different size ear canals. Um, you have to make sure that that's on there securely so that when you put it in your ear and you take it out the, fir the first time, uh, all of the pieces come out and, and you don't leave some in, leave some in there. Um, you know, I've heard a couple of uh, people that have had those little tips fall off in your ear. And then, you know, I mean, unless your your spouse is pretty good with a pair of tweezers, you probably are going to have to go somewhere and have that, uh, you know, taken out of your ear. So so there are some risks associated with uh, with, with over the counter in terms of, you know, I don't want to say they're, they're dangerous. And it, you're, you're right. But but yeah, you could over amplify or okay. you could end up hurting well, this you. Is, this is really good. And, and I think that because it's a new regulation and it's a new product, a new release, it's sort of it'll be interesting to see in you know a few years what some of the lessons learned were by introducing this to the market this way um right. the, yeah well there's i mean there is there is regulate around the regulations too in terms of how much gain and output there can be in these devices so okay. while you know i do caution you about you know wearing you know wearing them at their full volume uh, they are limited to the amount of gain that we would expect for someone with a, with a mild to moderate perceived hearing loss. Uh, so it isn't something that can uh, probably uh, use the phrase blow your eardrum out, but, uh, but, it, but it, is, uh, it is limited to some degree. So, that, so there are some, because the FDA is charged with making sure these devices are safe and effective, meaning they should be safe to use and, and the way you assemble them should be so that those things don't fall off. Um, and they should be effective for the for the type of loss that you're trying to work. Okay, just on. great. Okay, um, let's see. Shelby, uh, I guess at some point in when you were talking, did you refer to something as PCEPS? Oh, <clears throat> PSAP, PSAP, Personal P Sound Amplification Products. Okay, right? PSAP. PSAP, Personal Sound Amplification Products, and that 
those are referred to as the like the TV ears, the pocket talker, correct? Yeah, or or even devices that might look like uh, a hearing aid, but have very minimal amounts of gain. And they they used to be sold as amplifiers for hear for people with hearing loss. Okay. And and the FDA took a very dim view of that and put some guidelines around it. Now we have a PSAP regulation, so personal sound amplification, and we have the OTC regulations. So they cannot advertise a PSAP as the intended use for people with hearing loss, if that makes sense. In other words, the intended use is bird watching and, and maybe going hunting or listening for whatever else, you know, but it isn't to treat your hearing loss. That's not okay. intended now, use for um, Okay, and then now I recall the the, is there a category called assisted listening devices? Correct. Is, is, Correct. That's what the pocket talker would be. Right. That's where I was going to go back to it. That's another okay. whole class. Of devices, right? Okay, <laughs> great, great. Um, okay, so Shelby, hopefully we we got that for you. PSAP, uh, yep. personal sound um, amplification product. Okay, yeah. okay. Now um, let's see here. Okay, um, uh, let, let's see. Okay, and then. Oh, Bonnie O'Leary. Okay. Bonnie O'Leary is in the audience, and uh, I'm excited to have her. Um, Dr. Powers, Bonnie O'Leary is um, with the Northern Virginia Center for Hearing Loss. And oh, okay. uh, back 14 years ago, I moved in and I lived in a variety of retirement communities when I was 43 years old. And Bonnie would come to the talks that I would give about that experience. And one of her, she, I remember because she'd ask a lot of questions, but one of the things she would ask, she said, do those communities that you uh, live in have that music in the background, you, you know, when you're walking around the halls? And I was like, well, yeah. It's like, well, do you know how annoying that is to people with hearing aids? And I was like, I had no idea. And then yep. she also said, what are what are the loop devices? Where uh, Loop and T-coils, right? Yeah, do do they have those for their residents with with hearing aids? And I was like, you know, I don't know. And she invited me to a hearing loss support group that I went to, where there was a variety of people with various different hearing loss, and and it was it was really one of the best things that I ever did because I realized that number one, a lot of times you can't see if somebody has hearing loss, um, right. the, the hearing aids are so small now, but I think a lot of us think that if somebody has a hearing aid in, they're like the bionic woman where, well, I can whisper across the room and she's gonna hear me. And uh, this, this one woman in the support group, she said, you know, I have hearing aids now. I used to really enjoy going to parties and now, I can only go to a public event for about 30 minutes because it's overwhelming, you know, all the sounds and it's just exhausting. Um, any, I know I threw a bunch of stuff out there, but um, th thanks for being in the audience, Bonnie. But um, any sort of thoughts on that or that you can share with our, our audience? Sure. It, you know, I, I think the first one is one that that I think everyone struggles with, and that is uh, this this issue of background noise. And and everybody thinks background noise has to be some you know it's a restaurant or somewhere else. But something as simple as music playing, like you mentioned, in the hallways, if you're trying to walk down the hall and you do have hearing loss and you do have a hearing aid on, um, you know that becomes a competing signal. And while, while that's probably not the worst one, the worst one is other people talking because mm -hmm. now you have speech on top of speech, which has the exact same frequency content, et cetera. And so now when you go into a, a, you know, a meeting or a bridge club or some kind of where everybody's talking over dinner, just even in the, in the uh, dining area, uh, that becomes a, a very, very complicated scenario for people with hearing loss because Speech on speech becomes well. Is it the person I'm trying to listen to here, or is it that one over there? And if and if that conversation, whatever the topic is, is interesting, somehow you get drawn over there, and now now it becomes really complicated. So uh, so background noise is 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 difficult. Loops, as you mentioned, and telecoils. 
um, you know, are, are much more pervasive in Europe than they are here. There are pockets in, in, in certain parts of the country. Uh, you know, Wisconsin and it has to have a whole bunch of them, but that's because a fellow audiologist of mine is a, is a huge advocate for, 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 for those uh, loop systems um, and, and has had you know, great success getting them in public places, churches, synagogues, um, et cetera. And the way this works is uh, a loop is, is literally a string of wire in, in a very simple form, a string of wire that goes around the room and potentially underneath the carpet, back and forth, back and forth. And what that does then is it connects to the PA system, let's say in a, in a church or an auditorium, right? So while somebody's talking into the microphone and it's broadcasting through the speakers, it also is creating an electromagnetic field in the room. In a hearing aid, there's a little device called a T-coil that's, that's basically a coil that picks up that magnetic signal. And when you switch on your telecoil, you turn off the microphone typically of the hearing aid. So now the input is through this electromagnetic field and there is no other competing signal because the mic is turned off. So now, in essence, you are listening at the speaker's mouth because that mouth is at the microphone. And so whatever competing signals um, there is, it, it just isn't there. People talking behind you, which they shouldn't be if you're <laughs> trying to listen to a church or a synagogue. Uh, and so T calls are, are really an, an effective tool, uh, you know, for, for folks with hearing loss in those kind of environments. And there's, um, you know, uh, they're continuing to evolve as is Bluetooth. Now we're, we, we have some new Bluetooth stuff, which we can get into if we need to, but, but yeah, that T calls are, are also a pretty uh, important resource for, for a lot of people, which, which helps with the background noise because it gets rid of the microphone. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And I liked how you described that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Let's see. I'm just going to keep on going through these questions and you jump, right. just jump in and, and folks, just, if you got a question, throw it in there. And this is a great way for us to have a conversation about all things hearing loss. Um, Shelly says, uh, how do you, feel, what do you feel about warehouse stores versus the regular, a doctor's office? So I guess like Costco and Sam's club, I think I've seen audio or audio. I don't want to call them audiologists because I'm not sure if they are audiologists. Um, yeah but an audio uh, department there. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, they all have uh, hearing care professionals working there. They all have to be licensed. If you're working in those environments, you need a license. Now, some of them uh, are audiologists and have an advanced degree. You have to have a clinical doctorate in, in audiology. And, uh, you know, it takes four years of undergraduate and three years for your AUD. Well, uh, some of us back in the day, we got PhDs because there was no AUD. So. Um, and there are some hearing professionals then that either learn on the job, do a, a training. There are some states that have two-year community uh, college uh, programs where you can go and learn about what hearing is about, how hearing aids work, how to take ear impressions, how to do the adjustments, et cetera. So you have an associate's degree. So a variety of people you know, work in those environments. Um, I, I think they're a great source. And, and again, because they all have to be licensed and pass a, a, an exam in order to work there. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't just, uh, you know, walk it off the street <laughs> and start, you know, fitting hearing aids. Um, so I think they have, they have some great technology there. They, they work with the manufacturers and only get the, you know, uh, if not the highest, the second level, high, you know, really good technology. Uh, and, and because, you know, because it is a warehouse, um, you know, their pricing can be a little bit better than someone that has to maintain an office. And, you know, you're on a concrete floor, you're not on carpet, I always say. And there's, uh, you know, it, there's just differences in, in how you shop there versus, uh, you know, someplace that's different. So uh, I think they, they, they do a good job. They have a, a requirement uh, that everybody who gets fit there has to have what we call a probe mic or real ear measurements. So they verify what sound is going into your ear with a little microphone that goes down in your ear canal. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a great place to get devices um, that's, you know, a little bit less expensive than going to a, a traditional office. On the other hand, there aren't that, you know, there's a couple hundred in, in, in the U.S. and you may not have one near you. So if you don't, then, uh, you know, you need to, to see what resources you have in terms of a, either an audiologist or a hearing care specialist in your area. And, you know, and then I think, you know, go in and you talk to them about what your needs are and, and uh, also your your budget for for what you're right. going to spend. You know, that's a that's a discussion that that, that has to take place. Yeah. OK, good. Yeah. And I, I think the 
the warehouse stores have I've I've done some glasses there and they seem to uh be doing this in a very professional manner. So this is good. This is good to hear. Um let's see, Kathy says, as you were describing the different types of hearing aids, she says, what do the prescription devices offer that the that the the non-prescription devices don't? Yeah, I think um some of the differences are in, in terms of the uh, I'll call it the I hate to it features, but but the algorithms that are that are in there in, in, on the chip, right? I mean, they all have to provide amplification, so they make things louder, but they make that done in a very specific way uh, for your hearing loss. Most people have hearing loss in the higher frequencies, uh, which is why we have trouble understanding because that's where the consonants are, right? So K and D and T and D and P. You know, it's hard to differentiate those if you don't really get them, but vowels, A, E, I, they're pretty loud. They're easy to, to hear because they're they're louder and they're low frequency and our, usually our hearing is good there. Um, it, it, and so those devices have specific ways to amplify. Then the other things that they have are maybe a little bit more advanced features on noise suppression, getting rid of that background noise. Uh, feedback reduction. I mean, feedback is, is a big issue. We all, you know, hear stories about grandpa's hearing aid that whistled all the time, right? <laughs> and, um, and, and so, you know, we've done a really good job in terms of those algorithms with our engineering folks um, to, to sense that feedback and actually put in a signal that's the opposite so it cancels out that, that feedback so we don't end up with a lot of whistling anymore. Um, you know, and so I, I think it's those kinds of, of features uh, that are in some of the prescriptive devices that you may or may not see. The other is, of course, Bluetooth connectivity. Um, some of the OTC devices do have Bluetooth connectivity so that you can stream music or your phone calls to, to your device. Um, uh, not, not all yet, um, but, but I think some of the early ones, there are a few out there that do have uh, streaming capabilities. And I think the, the other one, the other big thing is, is that if you have a sort of a unique hearing loss. And by that, I mean, you know, when we think about an audiogram, there's, you know, a chart that goes from zero to 100, you know, and if you're flat across there, it, it could be that that it's going to be maybe easier to program a device for that as opposed to someone that has this sharp drop off in the high frequencies or um, has real difficulty in background noise. Uh, one of the things we've recently discovered in audiology in the past, let's say, five years, 10 years, is a thing, I, I don't like the term, but it's called hidden hearing loss. Um, the all hearing loss is hidden. You don't really have a sign out here that says you have hearing loss. But, uh, but hidden hearing loss tends to be people that had normal hearing on a hearing test. So zero to 25 is normal, 25 and up, you have, you have hearing loss. You could be in that zero to 25 range. You can hear tones very well. If I give you some words to repeat in quiet, you, you get 100% of them. The minute I put some background noise in, maybe you're, you only repeat 50% back. Hmm. Because, because that competing noise just totally destroys your ability to differentiate the consonants, et, et cetera. And now everything is a jumble. Um, so it doesn't take necessarily a lot of hearing loss to cause um, somebody to, to really have trouble with understanding. In that case, um, you know, you're, you're talking about some, some pretty intense programming and, and working through those things. And if, if you're, I'll say, one of those folks that has those kinds of hearing difficulties, whether it's a unique audiogram or this, this hidden hearing loss, you know, OTCs may not necessarily be the thing for you because it may not give you that specific programming uh, individualization that you would get from, from a prescriptive device. Uh, all of those typically are hooked up to a computer and then are programmed for your specific audiogram. Wow. And, and then, you know, they have a whole range of things that can be adjusted. Uh, so, so they're a little more complicated devices. Although we are seeing some, some OTCs uh, that uh, can have the same capabilities um, and, and maybe it's being done through telehealth. I mean, you, you can do a remote visit with an audiologist who can, who can do some of that programming and not, not all of it, but, but, but a great meant much of that programming. So. No, that's good, good. Um, now, Robert, now we're getting in the weeds here with a few of the questions that I see on the screen, but I like this one from Robert. He says, yep. I'm 85. I can insert my hearing aids. However, I find it difficult to get them inserted properly. 
please provide guidance as to how to get them properly inserted. Also provide advice on how to remove wax from the ears. Debrox does not seem to help. And, and before you answer, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I, I will tell everybody, make sure you get your ears checked by a professional because I, I was in uh, an emergency room once for something entirely different. And before I knew it, they had a uh, somebody in there cleaning out. I, I have no idea how there was that much wax in my ears. It was horrible. And uh, it was so embarrassing. But uh, they, they looked at me, they're like, can you hear us? You know, is that much wax? I, I, I'm glad to hear other people are having these problems, Robert uh, and, and Tom, but, but any guidance that you can give Robert on inserting and dealing with wax? Yeah, you know, I think um, in general, I think the, the, the wax issue we can deal with first, maybe because that's just the one. I think, you know, wax is produced to sort of keep your ears clean and to catch things that might fly in there like bugs and stuff, you know. Um, and, and eventually there are little hairs in your ear, ear and canal that sort of push outward. So the wax tends to go out when you shower and stuff. But for some people it doesn't and it just keeps building up. Or if you think you try to clean your ears with a Q-tip and what you do is you just push it, push it in further and further. Um, so, you know, we always say, don't put anything bigger than your elbow in your ear, but uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, so I think it, it is a good idea when you go in, um, you know, for a physical, especially those of us that, you know, if you're on, the, you know, Medicare and you're in once a year for your, for your uh, you know, your checkup, um, they usually do take a, a look in your ear or uh, have it done. Or if you know you're a, what I call a wax producer, um, you probably should go see your GP or someone once or twice a year and just make sure that gets cleaned out. Because if you have that much wax, their comment is well, Deborah isn't doing it it is going to have a real difficulty because we also have very different kinds of wax. Some are, are sort of real, real um, waxy. Others, some get very hard, uh, almost like a plug, you know, in your ear. And those sometimes are, are a little difficult, even for professionals, you know, to, to take it out. So um, I, I would encourage people to make sure that's, that's done. Going back to the question about insertion, you know, it depends a little bit on whether you have custom devices, uh, you know, that fit just into your ear canal or if they go over the top of your ear, behind your ear, and then have a tube or something that go into your ear canal. Uh, for the ones that go behind your ear, I usually recommend that people put them over the top of their ear. And I actually have a pair of ear that I, you know, if, if it will work. Um, so here you get, you know, one of these. If you put it over the top of your sort of ear first, now this is behind here, and I got this little thing hanging down. Now I can just grab that and just sort of push it with my finger. And now all of a sudden I can feel it go in because it's, you know, typically those are custom fit for your ear. Uh, and so, so, you know, if you try to put it in your ear first and the other thing is dangling down and sometimes then it falls and it's on the floor and then you got to pick it up. So I think for those kind, it's, it's usually to get the behind the ear part on first and then put it in. If it's a custom uh, fit one that goes in your ear, the key, the key part there is making sure that you have the right, and I mean the R-I-G-H-T, the <laughs> right ear that you're putting into your right ear and not the left one, <laughs> not the incorrect one, but the left one. And usually they're marked with red and blue. Red is for right, blue is, is for the left. That's because that's the circles and X's we put on an audiogram. So everything gets right. So if you have a, a custom one, look for the, the red line or dot or something and then it's just a matter of getting it sort of oriented and feeling it around and then getting it pushed into your ear. So, uh, and if you're struggling with those things, I would go back to your, your professional if, if, you, if that's where you got them. Uh, but there also are some great, great videos out on either the, the hearing aid manufacturer site or um, HIA, the Hearing Industry Association, hearing.org. Um, you know, they, they have some videos out there that, that show you training types of hearing aids, et cetera. So, uh, you know, there are, there are lots of, you know, you can search anything today. Online, you know? Yeah. So great. Well, Robert, hopefully those are a couple of good suggestions for you. Let's see. Beth uh, asks, which hearing aids use one of the noise reduction techniques? The noise resistant techniques are ZB, Zeta noise blocker, beam forming, or other. Um, wow, this is a foreign language to me. Do you understand what uh, Beth is asking? 
Yeah, I do. Uh, Zeta noise blocker was was a, a, a name given to a, to a noise reduction strategy years ago. Um, uh, beam formers are directional microphones, and, and that's the most common um, form of of, uh, of looking for directional my, directional hearing. Um, noise suppression typically is for for steady state noise, a vacuum cleaner, a fan, uh, you know, something like that. Noise reduction in hearing aids, what it does, it, it, you know, it's, it's complicated, but the algorithm in the device identifies the frequency. It knows it's a vacuum because it can identify the frequency, and then it can take that channel. Usually there's 20 or 30 channels, and if you think about it, by hearing it almost like a piano, right? If, if the noise is on one of the black or the white keys, what you do is you just take that one out, <laughs> and now the noise is gone. Directional microphones work on a principle where there's actually two microphones in the hearing aid. One faces forward, one faces backwards. There's a time delay. So if things come from the back, it hits the back microphone first, works its way around to the front microphone. Of course, if it comes from the front, it hits this one first. That time delay tells the hearing aid where the sound is coming from. And, and typically, because as humans, we face forward and we talk to people. So we use this beam forming where the direction of the of the device tells the, the, the you want to listen to that stuff in the front and the stuff from behind we'd like to get reduced. So the hearing aid then identifies that noise that's in the restaurant back here as noise and starts to reduce those frequencies so that you can hear the person in front of you. So those are our are, are directional microphones and um, and, and beam formers are, are that thing. But Zeta, Zeta was just a, a company name that somebody gave to a, to a noise reduction. Okay, great. Um, and uh, okay, uh, we got a ton of great questions. I'm glancing at these. Um, I just want to remind everybody, we record this. And Dr. Powers, are you okay hanging on for a little past the hour to get through these? Okay, good, good, because these are great. And, and the reason I brought that up is because Paula has a question, and this could send us down a rabbit hole here, but I think it's very important, is what resources available are for financing hearing aids um, for Montgomery County residents, that's in Maryland, but we have people all over the country, Paula, I guess, let's talk about financing of hearing aids in general terms. Yeah. In general, I would say there's... Um, well, the first and foremost, uh, well, if you're not going to finance, of course, you write a check. So then we're not talking about financing. <laughs> so, but for most people, it would either be using their credit card, of course, because you know then you can pay it off over a certain period of time. There are some companies that actually, uh, one of them is called Care Credit. I'm not well, hey, actually, let's them. back up um, before we talk about the. Uh, are there any Medicare, Medicaid, oh, um, okay. gotcha. or the because? I guess, are there some programs out there that can pay for your hearing aid through insurance or what have you? Okay. Because if you exhaust that, then we got to start writing checks using credit cards. Yes, Medicare Medicare specifically excludes hearing aids. It did from the very beginning and it continues to this day. It does not pay for hearing related services that are related to the fitting of a hearing aid. So if you walk into an audiology office and say, I'd like a hearing test so I can get a hearing aid, that hearing test would not be reimbursed by Medicare. If I say, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I'd like a hearing test, Medicare would pay for that test because it's medically required okay. to find out what's going on, right? Or And you may need a physician referral depending on how your insurance works, um, but, but Medicare excludes hearing aids and vision and dental, of course, right? Unless you're in Medicare Advantage, and that's a whole different whole different animal over yeah, there. And we could do three hours on that, but right. um, okay. Uh, but, but Medicare Advantage does, does cover uh, hearing aids and, and dental and stuff. And you see those commercials on TV all the time. So, so that's a, that's an option. So that if people are interested and and that's an important aspect to it, then maybe you consider a Medicaid, Medi sorry, Medicare Advantage program. Medicaid, of course, uh, you know, is a different program, primarily for you know low income or other people who have disability, et cetera, et cetera. They also have programs that pay for hearing aids. Some states, they call it different things in different states, but um, vocational rehab, usually there's a department of vocational rehab or something like that. So that let's assume you have a, either a traumatic injury or a sudden hearing loss. You just, I mean, there are things that just cause sudden hearing loss. One day you wake up and boom, you can't hear. Um, uh, they would provide assistance 
to potentially get your hearing aid so you can go back to work because that, that you know obviously you were a productive member of society it wasn't your fault that whatever happened in the middle of the night that you you lost your hearing so there is vocational rehab uh, and there are other programs that um, usually if your audiologist or professional you're going to go see again these resources are probably not as obvious in the OTC land as they would be if you go see a professional you get your hearing test you know what you're you know what you need and then say, okay, now what resources are available? That That's a, a really good source because they'll know what's available in that state, primarily because again, they have to be licensed. They have to go through you know, some things, learning what, what's going on in that particular state. Um, so those would be the, the, the primary, I would say resources are, uh, you know, Medicare Advantage, your personal insurance, um, you know, sometimes, uh, does have a, a hearing aid coverage. They may provide a, a benefit, a thousand dollars, five hundred dollars, you know, what, whatever. I saw something pop up there. Yes, if you're a veteran, you can go to the Veterans Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, VA uh, does cover hearing aid for service-connected um, veterans, and it's hard not to be. I mean, listen, if you're <laughs> when you're in the military, you shoot a lot of guns, right? So, so, so it's hard not to get a hearing loss, if you will. Uh, from being in the military. Um, and so it, it almost uh, most everybody, I won't make the statement, but a lot of people are service connected. And if you are, you can go to the VA and they will test your hearing and they will get your hearing aids because, uh, you know, it's I would say you can, right? And so- No, these are some some great resources there. And, and folks use chat if you've got, if you know about any programs, because locally, you know, maybe there's a nonprofit that you're aware of that, provide support to people, share those resources. We'll put it up with the recording on chat. Um, I you know, another good one, another one I want to point out here is, is the Hearing Loss Association of America, HLAA. Um, you know, this is a consumer group uh, that's focused totally on hearing loss and hearing related issues. And they have a tremendous amount of resources on, on their site. Um, it was started years ago by a fellow, uh, Rocky Stone, created it originally, it was called Shush, self-help self -help for the heart of hearing, and then changed the name to HLAA. Um, uh, there you go. And, um, you know, they, they have uh, their convention coming up. They have a lot of great resources. You can look at find support. Um, you know, Barbara Kelly, I, I just saw her this past week at a, at a show. Um, they have chapters all over the country. Um, and, and so it, it's a great resource. Mm. There you go. <laughs> um, you know, for for people on on hearing and hearing aids and hearing loss. Um, so I can I, I highly recommend their convention is great. They have a lot of good meetings and seminars around uh, around the country. So uh, yeah, they're pretty active in the D.C. area. Yeah, this is uh, great for. We have people from all over the country, but we're very strong in the Mid Atlantic between uh, Washington and Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So. This is a great resource. I'll make sure to drop this into um, into chat for everybody. And um, yeah, excellent. Um, let's see. Uh, boy, there are the financing. Then there, then there are other places that I mean, there's you know credit card companies and stuff, et cetera, that will that will you know you can finance and that specifically also work with with vision and even even dental and, and this care credit. They sort of do the things that uh, that don't get covered by your insurance. So yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Patty has a question. What is your opinion on the Lyric brand? Leave yeah. in the year hearing aids. They are taken out on a predetermined schedule. So sort of like the permanent contact lenses or, you know, long-term contact lenses. Um, yeah, I didn't realize this existed. This is pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Lyric is um, uh, a brand. Um, it's made by the, 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 company is Sonova Phonak. It's a, their, their big brand name company, but, but Lyric is a, is a device. It's, it's a completely in the canal. So it goes all the way down into your ear canal quite deeply. It's actually put there by the professional, uh, typically an audiologist um, uh, and or a specialist, but usually, uh, and it can be left in place for three to six months. Um, you know, it, it has a, a, an extended battery uh, that can get work for that long period of time. And then um, if uh, at the end of the, you know, the, the wearing time, depending on the, the device itself, uh, you would come back to the, um, uh, the audiologist, they would take that one out, they would put another one in and you can leave this in, you can shower with it. I mean, some people put a, you know, maybe an earplug over the top, just, but, but it's, it's completely, you know, for the most part sealed. 
Uh, you, you just have to be careful, you know, uh, if you know you don't want to be underwater for a long period of time uh, with with the device. But um, you know, it it, it can uh, be left in there on a, on a permanent uh, basis. There's there's a, a second one um, uh, that's called Ear Lens, which is another interesting device that that literally looks like a contact lens that's put on your eardrum by a physician, by an ear, nose, and throat specialist. And then the device, the part that goes into your ear, doesn't send, um, it doesn't sound acoustic signal. It sends a light beam that goes to that contact lens. Um, and then that vibrates your eardrum and sends a signal down in, you know, through the rest of your auditory system. Um, so it, it uses a, a light technology to transmit sound as opposed to a loudspeaker. Um, so there's some, there's some really very interesting um, innovations, yeah, innovations that are happening uh, in terms. Now you know that, that's a, a much more expensive device, but but it is out there and it's uh, you know uh, it's something if somebody wants that sort of extended work, that lens stays there for for a long, long, long period of time. You do take the device off at night, but the, the lens stays on the eardrum and uh, pretty minimal maintenance. You have to put mineral oil in your ear to keep it you know in contact, but. But, uh, you know, they'll explain that all to you. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see. A um, couple of questions on different types of hearing aids here. Uh, yeah. One was Bonnie O'Leary says, when you did your little demonstration, you demonstrated the open fit. Not yeah. everyone can wear that model. What about larger molds? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this 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 is sort of a just has a little uh, dome or thing on, on the outside. And I just grabbed it because I got lots of devices in front of here. Um, but yeah, there there was also you know custom molds that actually fill up in, in, your entire ear or have little um, tabs on the bottom so it allows it to stay into your ear. Uh, most all of those are done by taking an impression of your ear. So we mix up some material, squirt it in there. When it gets hard, goes off to a lab. Uh, and then it comes back uh, and, and it an attaches either with a tube or snaps on to the end. Uh, and, and people that have to, uh, you know, wear those, that, that they're a little more secure, I, I guess, because they cust they're custom fit, uh, much like uh, custom in the ear devices. Probably have some of those around here someplace, but I don't know where I did with them today. But okay. <laughs> yeah. And then um, Bob has a question, similar question. Dr. Powers, could you explain the classes of devices and the differences? of air conduction and bone conduction hearing. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, air conduction just, just means that the sound is transmitted via the, a little loudspeaker. I mean, if we think about hearing aid as the simplest of all devices, the simplest way of thinking about it, we have a microphone that picks up the signal that goes to an amplifier in the middle. The amplifier sends the sound to a loudspeaker uh, and we have a battery. Those are the four four basic components of the hearing aid. Um, and so the loudspeaker, or people sometimes refer to it as the receiver, because it goes back to telephone technology back in the early days. Um, they used to refer to it as the receiver, but it, it actually is a loudspeaker. Um, sends the acoustic signal into your ear canal, which then hits your eardrum, which then goes through the middle ear bones and then goes into the nerve and up to your brain. A bone conduction device is uh, typically uh, either on a, a headband, it can be on eyeglass templates. There are some uh, bone conduction devices that are attached to the templates of your eyeglasses. And the, the bone conductor fits just behind your ear. Uh, if you, if you um, uh, reach back there and you can feel like a little bump uh, that's usually referred to as the mastoid um, bone in the back of your head there. Um, and if you put a bone conduction oscillator on there, typically it's used for people that have some issue with their external canal or the middle ear bones. I think I saw somebody who said they had a stapedectomy, which is a, a reconstructive procedure for the middle ear bones. But uh, if, if that's not working, but your nerve is okay, so further in your head, if you vibrate your skull, um, you know, that signal goes directly in, into the cochlea. And then that sends it up to your brain and it bypasses this whole outer part of your ear canal and the uh, eardrum and the middle ear. Um, and so for people that have, um, there are some uh, uh, defects called atresia where you, there is no ear canal. It's just, it's all solid, you know, bone or, you know, et cetera. Uh, but, you, but your nerve is okay inside. Uh, you can wear one of these bone conduction devices. There are some, some new bone conduction devices. Um, this may sound a little, 
<laughs> over the top here, but basically they have a, an abutment, which is basically a screw that can be put into your back behind on this bone. And then a little device is sort of, you know, it snaps onto it. It's called a, a, a Baja bone anchored hearing aid. So it's anchored in that bone. Um, and, and for many people, uh, that's, that is great because the quality, the sound quality is good because the nerve is good. The problem with air conduction is you put a really clean signal into a distorted cochlea and that's when it doesn't sound quite so clear. The hearing aid is producing pretty good sound, but your, your auditory system is maybe not sending the best uh, you know, signal all the way to your brain. So this is why we have to program it and, and try to get it, get you the best quality sound that we can, especially when you have a unique kind of hearing losses like, like you might need for bone conduction. Great. And then uh, uh, Bob asked, what's a good resource on credible hearing loss statistics? And Bonnie O'Leary jumped in with the um, hearingloss.org as being a great resource. And I can see right on their um, main yep. homepage, they've got a section that you can access different stats. Uh, so um, I'm assuming that's where you go for stats as well, uh, Dr. Powers. Yeah, part of it, yeah, part of it is we also, you know, I do obviously consulting. I don't work for, but I do consulting for the Hearing Industries Association, um, and you know, they collect data on how many hearing aids are sold and, and that kind of stuff because it's mostly the manufacturers. Um, but NIH also, uh, National Institute of Health, also has statistics on hearing. You'd go to the NIH site and then do some searching on hearing. Um, you know, estimates are there's, you know, 48 million people in the United States with hearing loss. And, um, you know, you can you can find a lot of statistics on how many are mild, moderate, severe cochlear implants, et cetera, on, uh, you know, on the National Institute of Health site right. as well. But right. you're right. That or, or NHL. Folks, we're going to keep on going through here, but some of you are going to probably have to jump off the call. But remember, this is recorded. Um, yeah. Let's see. Krista wanted to know what what is. The light transmission product called again? Ear lens, E A R L E N S, ear lens. Yeah. Okay, it's great. No, good, good name there. Uh, um, and then uh, let's see. Um, okay. The What is loop, loops and telecoils? Cindy asks. We talked about that earlier in the discussion, uh, but can you give a quick uh, overview? Yeah. Of that. Yeah, yeah. Loops, yeah. Loops, loops and telecoils. So, so the, the telecoil is in the hearing aid, and basically, I mean, it's it's a it's a piece of metal with wire wrapped around it that allows you to pick up this electromagnetic field. And the the loop is a wire that's run uh, around a room, typically on the floor underneath. It could be in the ceiling, but usually it's underneath. Um, and that creates, if you can imagine. Uh, almost like if you were heating the room and, and heat's coming up, but actually sound is coming out of there in a, an electromagnetic uh, field. And when you turn on the T-Qual, you turn typically off the microphone. So now any extraneous noise is gone. And all you pick up is this sound from the T-Qual, from the loop. The loop is the part around the room, the T-Qual is in the hearing aid. And in essence, you're hearing exactly what's being spoken into the microphone or whatever the system is that's, that's up front. Typically, yeah. uh, you see this in, in some, uh, you know, churches, synagogues, community theaters, buildings, theaters, theaters, public buildings. We're seeing more in, in courthouses and stuff being installed because obviously people are here compared that end up there for a variety of reasons. So, so yeah, loops are becoming, um, you know, uh, uh, pretty semi semi common in some parts of the country. Okay. Yeah. And then um, Deborah asks. What's the difference between an in-ear and a behind-the-ear hearing aid? Uh, it, it's, the most is what they look like. Um, okay. they, they, they typically have very similar signal processing capabilities. The, the one potential difference is it's a little more difficult to have the directional microphone uh, technology, especially as you get smaller and smaller in, because you, you can't have the separation between the two microphones. Um, and so, so behind the ear devices can have these two microphones because you have enough space. The ones that are full shell that fill up your whole ear, you can get a couple of microphones in there. Now, the, the advantage, of course, of in the ear ones is this, this gadget here is a great collector of sound. That's what it's intended for is to funnel mm -hmm. sound to your ear canal. So, so even some of the devices that fit down in your ear canal 
you actually get some benefit of the microphone being in your ear because now you you use the outside. Whereas if the microphones are up here on top of your ear, you're not using the collector. And we we sort of compensate for that by having all this great signal right. process. And and again, at the beginning of the discussion, we talked about the stigma of hearing aids. And obviously, because the stigma is so great, uh, the the small ones that you can't see are a preference for some people. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that we're seeing though is is that this this the stigma is, is declining. I think for a number yes. of reasons. One, one, you know, I I think as as younger folks get less concerned about that, but also. Uh, you know, think about when you walk around the street, how many people have got white ear things hanging out of their ears all day today. Exactly. And, you know, AirPods and, and other devices like that are, are now making it much more common to see people with stuff in their ear. And so many of these new OTCs are, are designed to look like those earbuds. So we really don't know, you know, what you got in there, whether it's an earbud, whether I'm just listening to music. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to adjust it with the app on your phone, People just think you're rude doing your email, but you're really you're, you're adjusting your your hearing aid by uh, by using your app. So so they've really taken a lot of that stigma, and it's beginning to, to I think to decrease. There's there's still a fair amount because you know everybody gets glasses, everybody gets that, but but hearing aids are something that it's like the last thing I want to get before I get in the box. I've heard somebody say, you know, yeah, and, I, I I mean, unfortunately, that's kind of the way it is, and. You know, yeah. there's the people who are like, I'll never go to a nursing home. And then they might need a nursing home. And it's it, it's tough. Right? There's a stigma associated with a lot of the things in our space. Um, Bob has a good question here. How do hearing aids impact memory loss and dementia? And I think there is some chatter in the chat on that topic. But mm -hmm. um, have you had any experience in this area? Yeah, there, there's a lot of research uh, that's that's taking place. As a matter of fact, Baltimore, John Hopkins has has a huge research project that's just finished. I was just talking with uh, Dr. Frank Lim. He was out at the Consumer Electronics, so I just had a chat with him. Um, you know, we know that hearing loss it is one of the modifiable risks for dementia. And by that, I mean that if you treat hearing loss, um, 8 to 12 percent of the risk of developing a dementia and or cognitive decline, whichever, you know, not, not all the way to Alzheimer's, but the cognitive decline and dementia, um, that risk can be mitigated by treating your hearing loss. I mean, that that was shown in, a, in an article in The Lancet several years ago. And, and now Dr. Lim's research is, is almost ready to be published saying that, yes, we can maybe push out the onset of cognitive decline or dementia by uh, keeping your brain active through maybe wearing glasses, but also certain hearing aids because uh, modifiable risk for vision is a lot less than it is for hearing. So, you know, you, you're hearing what that does for you is it keeps you communicating. Because you're communicating, you tend to be out with people. If you're out with people, you probably are walking around. If you're walking around, your heart, your blood pressure, and other things might also. So, so it sort of has this multiplier effect. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we have to be very careful about, though, is 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 um, trying to make this this leap or link to say if you treat your hearing loss, then you're never ever going to get uh, because we don't know that yet. All right, and so we we shouldn't have somebody say, well, you should go get your hearing aids because then you aren't going to have Alzheimer's. Well, we you know nobody can guarantee that because you know that relates to your brain and lots of other issues. However, cognitive issues and and, and certainly dementia issues. Uh, we know that we can we can modify that risk and maybe minimize that risk um, by doing something about your hearing. And, and and it also just gives you a great way to communicate with your spouse and family, by the way. Um, so, yeah, so there's there's a lot of great parts of, of uh, treating your hearing loss uh, in addition to, to the potential uh, great. risk for dementia. Um, and let's see, uh, Margie Hissel Arnold, who is an aging life care manager, says, my experience with clients at Costco hearing department has been quite good. So okay. for addressing one perspective of the warehouses. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, again, Carol brings up, um, do you know any resources for low cost or free hearing aids? We did talk a little bit about that. And I think there are some, um, I saw some, some posts. The lines, yeah. the lines, the lines has programs. Uh, there's, there's a number of, um, you know, the, uh, um, I'm trying to think the, um, uh, 
you know, community groups like 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 that. Uh, I'm trying to think of the, the the one of the names, but anyway, you know, th they have programs where people that maybe have fairly well working hearing aids, um, uh, you know, donate those to Lions clubs, etc., like that. And uh, if they're getting new devices, and then someone who can't afford them or or you know can then get them, you know, reprogrammed uh, for their particular hearing loss, and usually professionals are are in touch with those groups that, that have, um, you know, those kinds of resources. Um, and, and there's lots of them, like I said, your, your local hearing professionals are the one that sort of know those best. Um, or, or if there's an HLA chapter in your area, then of course, I, I would highly suggest that you, uh, that you look there or, you know, again, hearing dot, you know, betterhearing.org, which is the Ear Industry Association, all those resources around those places you can search for, for resources, yeah. Hmm. Okay. and. Um... Let's see, Nat says, what are your thoughts on a, what the National Council on Aging publishes regarding guidance on over-the-counter hearing aids? And Nat, I, I'm pulling up this link that you um, uh, are share, you shared there. And even though NCOA is behind this, I'm a little bit suspect. Yeah. This, this feels like, uh, a bit of paid advertising and marketing to me, but yeah. I could be wrong on that. Uh, yeah, it does look that way. Uh, yeah, I, my advice would be like, or, or is go. I, I would really look at like um, yeah, the yeah. Hearing Loss Association of America. And even though I'm a big fan of National Council on the Aging, that specific page to me looks a little bit like some external partnerships with paid providers yeah i i would agree i would agree and um okay where the heck are we now here um oh boy um oh, lots of good things in in chat here with the lions club lots of resources here um uh let's see uh what beth says what are the uh, new technologies to enhance speech understanding, including AI? These are, uh, there are technologies that exist that could be added to the hearing aid. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, we're, we're beginning to see AI uh, creep in. I, you know, the AI, artificial intelligence requires a lot of resources. And, and as, as, as you know, hearing aids are little devices. They have, yes, nice little computer chips inside, but they also have to run on pretty low power. So, uh, so we're, we're just beginning to see uh, AI come in. Uh, we've already seen a couple of manufacturers introduce uh, those with motion detectors so they can detect falls, uh, which of course is a big issue. So, uh, you know, at least at least one has it linked, of course, to your smartphone, and so if it de if it detects the fall, it has the capability to then have your smartphone send an alert to three people that you've already predetermined to say, uh, you know, typically with the ad, I fall and I can't get up, but um, you know, but but you begin to see this AI doing lots of of cool stuff. Um, I, I saw another great technology out at the Consumer Electronics Show in, in Las Vegas last week. Uh, a company has now, uh, it's not out on the market yet, so don't go running around, <laughs> a pair of glasses that actually can do speech to text and put that as captioning on the inside of the glasses. Holy cow, I love it. I I, I, I went to CES once and it's amazing the technology on display there in the healthcare space, health right. and fitness space uh, yeah. is, is really good. Um, yeah. This is a really great comment. Now we're over an hour, so we'll try to wrap this up in five minutes, folks. But the um, um, uh, Shelly is sharing that she's part of a nonprofit called oh, Access yeah. Hears. Mm -hmm. And yep. um, this looks wonderful here, Shelly. Um, it says, uh, what is she saying? Gosh, now I got, um, um, so Access Hears. If you look up Access Hears, you can uh, tap into this, but it sounds like they're really being very helpful in um, providing support. And it's funded by uh, the uh, Weinberg, AARP, and the Maryland Department on Aging. So if you're in Maryland, definitely check out Access Hears as, a, as another resource. 
Um, wow, uh, Meryl says I just Googled ear lens and they cost twelve thousand dollars a pair. Yes. Well, yeah, I, I, I said they're not cheap. <laughs> I think I said that. I, you know, I, I want to say, yeah, they're, uh, it, it's a very expensive system. Uh, you know, it's a fairly new, fairly way, it's edge technology, I'll say. Uh, but again, some people, you know, I mean, well, some people, and some look, people drive Mercedes and, and some people have. have yeah, if you, and if you have resources for a lot of these medical products, it's sort of like, what is the price to hear, you know? Uh, it, it, putting a price tag on that. Um, Robert, yes, the chat, don't worry. There's a lot of chat here. I will include that with the recording. Um, I'm, I'm kind of scrolling through to see uh, um, if there's any other uh, things here that are coming out that jump out at me. This, this is amazing. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Powers. But as I'm going through some of these to see if any jump out at me, the um, uh, thank you to our audience for such great questions. This is a hot topic. I think we need to get you have you come back. Um, I'm happy to do, um, I'm happy to do it. Sure. Meryl says I cannot wear behind the ear hearing aids because the uh, it creates irritation on my skin. Um, yeah, there are some people that it's very, I mean, obviously those cases are, are, are developed and manufactured to be hypoallergenic to, to some degree. I mean, that's a term that isn't authorized by the FDA, but, but there are some people that do have allergic reaction to, to, uh, you know, to the case materials. And so uh, uh, there are some, uh, some manufacturers that actually have cases that are, that are clear that have no coloring in them, which then help to avoid some of that. So if you, if you have that, you may want to, if you're wearing traditional devices, I haven't seen any clear OTCs yet, but I'm sure they'll be coming uh, down the road. But yeah, there are some out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cheryl says the brand Jabra, who I think is, we see those a lot with like, I think mm -hmm. devices like this uh, uh, are that are totally online. Are those considered over the counter? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, Jabra, it, Jabra is the it's a brand name from Great Nordic or GN. Uh, GN has does a lot of audio devices. They they have, do headphones, they do, you know, earbuds, and they also then have uh, Jabra here over the counter hearing aids, um, and um, uh, those are available both online. I believe in in uh, Best Buy has started carrying uh, OTC devices. In a few stores, not 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 all of them. I think a couple of hundred. Um, uh, but but yeah, and uh, and some some pharmacies have have or will start carrying over the counters. So um, Jabra. There's also other brands, Lexi. I mean, there's like you know a whole bunch of them. But um, uh, but yeah, you you should be able to find them in, in lots of places fairly soon. You have to remember this this rule went into effect, and the first day you could actually do this was October 17th. So we're not quite you know three or four months in here. So. Um, I think we'll see an expansion of where these devices are, are available. Jabra's are also available through professionals. So that Jabra Enhance, you can also purchase through some of the, you know, professionals or Beltone or uh, other you know, professional organizations, which then comes with a, a price tag of, you know, seven or $800 plus maybe a couple hundred dollars for a hearing test and some follow-up visits. So, you know, it, it, you just have to go out and search and find out what's best for you. you know? Great. Okay, I think looking at the clock, and I, I feel like we did a good job of getting through most of these. I, I'm Dr. Powers, I'm going to schedule another one this with you. This has been great. But but this is Donna says, I had stapendectomy surgeries in early 2000. Can that be repeated? What is a stapendectomy surgery? Yeah, stapendectomy, um, the, the uh, there's three bones in your middle ear. So you have your ear canal, your eardrum, and then there are three small bones, the incus, the malleus, and the stapes. And the stapes is the third one that connects to your cochlea, which is the actual hearing nerve, all right? Uh, stapendectomy surgery, um, people have a, a variety of things that happen where that, that has like, um, if you think about otosclerosis in a sense, or, or some kind of growth around the end of that little bone, that it doesn't vibrate, so you, so you you have trouble hearing. In a stapendectomy, they take it out and they put a little prosthetic in there, so that it, they they take that one out and they put another one in, 
Uh, there's a lot of a lot of ways that's that's a very simplistic view of, of that whole surgery because it's pretty complicated. But um, but yeah, so they put that in there and then reattach it, and then you know you, you still have a little bit of hearing loss, but you you can hear much better typically than you did um, you know prior to the surgery. And in most cases, yes, I mean, you, you should probably uh, talk to an ear surgeon uh, about that because, you know, I'm an audiologist. I've never done a, a surgery. In my, okay, in my, got it. Okay. Right. And uh, Shelly, my, we got one more question because uh, Shelly, I didn't, I'm looking at so many things on my screen. I didn't see that you had your hand up. So Shelly says, um, uh, I, she wanted to ask if any manufacturers will work with a patient directly on repairs. Hundreds, hundreds of dollars for hearing places to send it in, plus five hundred dollars for a pair with a phone act, which we broke our hearing mold three times. Someone said their molds break easier than others. We need a new hearing aid. So, um, any thoughts on Shelley's challenges and and what you could advise her? Yeah, you know it. it well, I go back to, to prior to October, right? The only way people dealt with hearing aids were through professionals because that's what the law said, right? Um, and, and so you, you should go back to a professional to get, to A, to get a hearing aid and also to get it repaired, um, it, typically not back to the manufacturer. Now that we have OTCs, we also still have prescription devices which the manufacturers are taking care of. Um, some manufacturers will allow the patient to send the device in directly um, if it's under warranty, that then you know it, it may be covered uh, under the warranty. Part of the part of the issue there is th that if someone is being charged for a repair, part of it is not only the repair of the device if it's out of warranty, but also it could be that you went into somebody's office and you spent a half an hour there, and then when you picked up the device, you they had to reprogram it or do whatever. So so now uh, let's just pick a number. $400, okay, or whatever, for whatever it was, it may be $150, $200 of it is the actual cost of repairing the device, and the other 100 or so is cost for the visit to be in the office. I'm just, I'm just making a big generalization here. Um, and, and so it just, it just depends, you know, where you are in that replacement or the warranty cycle, if it's under warranty. And, you know, today, most hearing aids are two and three years, uh, some, sometimes the provider will add additional warranty. Uh, and even after that part, there are companies that offer, you know, out of warranty replacement insurance, so to speak. So um, it, it, there's, there's a whole wide range of things. And so it, it's, it's hard to say that the manu all the manufacturers will, um, they'll certainly take the device in. The question is, how do they get it back to you? Um, that also goes back to state licensing. You know, if the state requires that people go um, go in there, uh, it could be that they're going to have to send it back to the professional, and you'll have to pick it up there. They might be able to send it to your house. You know, fifty states has fifty different rules, so it's hard it's hard to uh, you know to, to put that in in one one size fits all. I guess so. Again, part of it is the cost of the instrument, and part of it is the cost of the profession. Well, so Shelly, again, sorry, I missed your hand being raised there, um, doing the best that I can. But um, Dr. Powers, this has been absolutely amazing, sort of information overload. But um, again, thanks to everybody in the audience for your great yes. thoughts, questions, comments. I will get this recording up ASAP and uh, with the chat, so don't worry. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Powers, um, What's the is is it okay to share your email, um, or would you prefer that people just re reach out to Hearing Industries uh, Association? Uh, yeah, they, either one. I mean, okay. I, I, I'll they, drop that in on the recording. So if somebody was here that wanted some follow up, but yeah. um, but I will definitely be following up and 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 let's do this again. Oh, and and I really I actually for the people that are in the audience from this Access Hears program. Uh, I think maybe the next time we get together, uh, do a little collaboration and hear about this great program, because uh, any program that gets hearing aids in the hands of people that can't afford them is wonderful. Absolutely. And there's, you know, there's programs like that are, you know, in various parts of the country. So I did not, not to minimize their, their, certainly that's a great program that access hears. 
Um, but you're right, it, it, communities um, do, you know, come together as this one has here and uh, do things here, California, Oregon, you name it, uh, you know, there, there's great resources and uh, right. uh, we need more of them, certainly, but, uh, yep. but, but we'll get there. Excellent. All right. Thanks, uh, Dr. Powers, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Thank you for having me. Have a nice day, everybody.